me. Scott here from whattype.com, and in this video, I'm going to talk about the type INTJ. I'm going to talk about what those four letters mean. I'm going to talk about the traits that INTJ people tend to exhibit. I'm going to talk about some of the nuance of the type that leads INTJs to often be mistyped. I'm going to pepper this with celebrity video examples, and I'm also going to share a list of fictional INTJ characters as well. If you're watching this video because you're trying to figure out if you are an INTJ and you'd like some help getting clarity on your type once and for all, you can go to whattype.com slash mytype to learn about type reading sessions via Zoom. INTJs are deep thinkers and problem solvers. They don't like small talk. And I hate talking to people. And they don't suffer fools. I find your lack of faith disturbing. While there are no reliable statistics, it's widely believed that INTJ is one of the more rare types, and possibly the most rare amongst women. Some notable contributors to our understanding of type theory, people who have had a big influence on me, are and were INTJs. Carl Jung, whose work the entire theory is based on, was an INTJ, as is Cameron Huff, a pioneer in the field of type reading, and Dr. Dario Nardi, who's done groundbreaking work by cross-referencing EEG research and Myers-Briggs theory. Now let's get into what the four letters mean. The first letter is either I or E for introvert or extrovert. The I in INTJ indicates that they are introverts. As introverts, they'll typically do their best work in solitude, and they typically need a little bit more alone time to recharge their batteries than extroverts do. While INTJs can become confident in social situations and also with things like public speaking, many have had to overcome shyness or social anxiety as kids. Here's Metallica frontman James Hetfield talking about being shy as a kid and turning to music as a means of self-expression. I was pretty much afraid of everything, afraid of the world, afraid of speaking, you know, really, really shy kid. Music was a way to speak, as simple as that. The second letter is either N or S. This stands for intuitive or sensor. Because we were to use the letter I in the first letter to indicate introvert, we use the second letter of the word intuitive N to indicate intuitive in the second letter. Intuitives live in the world of imagination and possibilities, and they're more interested in what's going on behind the curtain than what's going on in front of the curtain, whereas sensors tend to live more in the world of tangible, verifiable reality and in the moment as it is. Here's professor and philosopher John Verveke talking about the nature of reality on the Lex Friedman podcast. This kind of conversation tends to be enjoyable for intuitives, but it will be difficult to tolerate tolerate for very long from most sensors because it's pretty far out there and there's not a clear practical application. A lot of your everyday experience is illusory, but that we do have some contact with reality whereby we can make the arguments as to why most of your experience, most of your everyday experience is an illusion. But to me, that's not a novel thing. That's, that's, that's Descartes. The third letter is either T or F, which stands for thinker or feeler. INTJs are thinkers. As such, they tend to have more acuity in the logical realm than in the emotional realm. Logic is usually a strength for INTJs early on, and then as they grow and mature, they tend to become more emotionally intelligent. This is my friend Jake, an INTJ, on a recent podcast episode talking about how he used empathy as a strategy, and it led to him actually becoming more empathetic. Well, you don't get to choose what you feel in the first place, but once you have that emotion, you get to stop and you get to decide, okay, is this rational or is this whatever? And in that way, I was able to kind of install almost software into myself to start having those emotional tools that I needed. And that also applies to empathy. So for me, I started finding answers through being empathetic. So empathy for me was almost a, a, a tool towards a solution that later ended in me actually having empathy more than I ever would have had I not found a solution that's there. How they, yeah, that, that's how they get you. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Final letter is either J or P, which stands for judger or perceiver. On the surface level, you could categorize judgers as being more structured and composed and perceivers as being more of improvisers who enjoy freedom. The truth is both judgers and perceivers need freedom and structure in their lives. Judges prefer to have things outside of them in the external world structured and taken care of so that they can feel more freedom inside their minds where they like to spend a lot of their time. Perceivers are wired the opposite way where they tend to be more structured inside their minds and therefore they prefer freedom in the external world. 
For INTJs who are judges, it can pull them out of flow if they have to constantly readjust for changing external parameters. This being the case, they'll often like to have an idea of what's going to be coming next so that they can be prepared for it. This is chess and jiu-jitsu master, learning expert, and consultant Josh Waitzkin talking about how he structures days for his clients. I think that a proactive day architecture versus a reactive one is hugely important. I think most people um, will have lots of meetings scheduled and then maybe they'll try to jam thinking in between the meetings. So they'll have like two minutes of thinking time in, in between, which is, from my perspective, disastrous because people are, their brilliance comes from thinking. Okay, so now let's look at temperament. So the four letters, I or E for introvert or extrovert, N or S for intuitive or sensor, T or F for thinker or feeler, and J or P for judger or perceiver, those give us 16 possible combinations, 16 Myers-Briggs types. An author named David Kiersey recognized in the 1970s that you can divide those 16 types into four basic categories or temperaments as he called them. Now, I'm going to give a very brief overview of each of the four temperaments, and I'm going to exaggerate this a bit. I'm going to make gross generalizations. There's a lot of nuance here in reality, but I'm going to give you a very simple picture so you can begin to see it, and then you can add nuance to your understanding over time. Now, keep in mind that no type or temperament is objectively better than any other. The key is understanding, acceptance, and cooperation. Okay, let's start with sensor judgers, types with an S and a J in their four-letter code. I've given this temperament the nickname citizens. This is the most traditional of the four temperaments. These are the people who are keeping society glued together and preventing the rest of us crazy people from destroying the world. I think that one of the things that the world started to, well, at least here, started to uh, fall short on was keeping people responsible for what they do. Next, we have sensor perceivers, types with an S and a P in their four-letter code. I've given this temperament the nickname catalysts. Catalysts live in the moment and in the sensory worlds. They push the boundaries of physical reality and they remind us to enjoy life. You don't sweat things, you enjoy life. Is that true? Is that uh, fair to say? Yes, I uh, tend to have, like to have a good time. <laughs> the next temperament is intuitive feelers, types with an N and an F in their four-letter code. I've given this temperament the nickname advocates. Advocates are activists at heart. They use unconventional thinking and emotional intelligence, and they are out to save the world. Advocates remind us to do good by each other and to look out for the greater good of humanity. And I've looked over... And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. Finally, we have intuitive thinkers, types with an N and a T in their four letter code. I've given this temperament the nickname masterminds. INTJs fall into this category. Masterminds use logic and unconventional thinking to challenge the status quo and generate new possibilities. I suppose you've disrupted the market to some extent by stepping out of the world of the gallery, which has, again, held sway, a bit like a bank used to hold sway with yeah. money. The, the, the galleries held sway with, with art. I think disruption's good. I mean, I've always loved disruption from yeah. the very beginning. It's like when somebody says, you can't do that, it's always inspired me to find a way to do it. And there is, you know, I've got everything I've ever tried, I've found when people say you can't do that, there, there is no reason why you can't do that. And I find that you can do that. And it's like, that's what, you know, that's what I find exciting about the world. Like advocates, masterminds can also self-identify as feeling like outcasts. And as they grow older, they can feel more comfortable in that role, feeling different from a lot of other people. Or being, if you, if you feel like an outsider as a kid, I think as you get older, you, start, you value that. That becomes like a bit of a superpower. You, you hang on to that feeling of, of um, being an outsider and you kind of use that. To start to form a perception of the INTJ type, let's look at four questions that healthy INTJs tend to ask often. Number one, what is the nature of the box? Myers-Briggs author Lenore Thompson-Benz pointed out that, well, many types will tend to think outside of the box, the box being a sort of set of assumptions that we operate under. INTJs, like INFJs, will tend to think about the box itself. What are these assumptions that we're making? What are the rules of the world that we're living in? 
The second question is, can the box be improved or are we even in the right box? This varies from ISTJs who tend to want to understand the box so that they understand how to operate within the box. INTJs will tend to challenge the box. Here's INTJ Alan Watts in the 1960s challenging the assumptions that we make and that we live under. Because you see, the concepts that we have in our heads do not fit nature. The Greeks gave us the notion that there are three dimensions. There are not three dimensions. The next question that a healthy INTJ will often ask themselves is, is this authentic? Does this feel right? Authenticity is an important anchor for any healthy INTJ. Finally, INTJs will tend to ask, how can I live more in the moment and enjoy the physical world? By nature, most INTJs, I think, would agree that they spend a lot of time in their heads. And being in the physical world can be very enjoyable for them because it gets them out of their mind. It gets them into the moment and into the physical world. Because this is especially enjoyable for them, many INTJs will dedicate a lot of their time and resources and energy into pursuits in the physical world. So INTJs may become personal trainers or even bodybuilders or musicians or athletes. And because most of them are not born physically gifted and they have to go through all the stages of competence to get good at things in the physical world, they tend to be good teachers in this realm. The truth is that there's a lot of myths floating around out there on the subject of body recomposition. And if you don't have a proper understanding of how the process actually works, you could easily end up wasting a ton of unnecessary time and effort, spinning your wheels and potentially not getting anywhere. Now let's talk about traits that you'll see in most INTJs. First and foremost, INTJs are independent thinkers. Most INTJs do not want to be told how to think. They tend to formulate their own ideas about the world at an early age and tend to develop a mistrust in conventional thinking. Through the deep examination that they tend to naturally sort of put the world around them through, they'll often come to the conclusion that the authorities that people submit to and that the rules that people live by often don't hold up to scrutiny, so they tend to be skeptical when ideas are presented to them. Next, INTJs are almost universally very strategic. In fact, some of the greatest strategists of all time have been INTJs, like Napoleon Bonaparte. This is a scene from the excellent Netflix historical drama called The Ottoman. This is the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, Mehmed II, talking about a battle plan against Vlad the Impaler and his army. Vlad's army is encamped somewhere in the woods, near here. 3,000, 4,000 men, with several thousand more all along the river. They do not have great numbers, but they are dangerous. We have signaled that we will be crossing here, where it's shallower and the river narrows. They will be expecting us there, laying in wait. But this is where we'll land 5,000 Janissaries and artillery as the first wave of our attack. Next, INTJs tend to be generally reserved. You won't typically see INTJs running around, freaking out, getting emotional, or wearing their hearts on their sleeves. This is entrepreneur Tom Bilyeu talking about maintaining composure. Because I see people flip the fuck out over some really stupid shit. Conversely, if you don't want something to be a big deal, this actually works then just don't react big to it. Next, INTJs tend to be very cerebral. This is in contrast to other types who tend to be more in the moment and in the physical world. INTJs tend to be deep thinkers. Here's astrophysicist Carl Sagan talking about a four-dimensional reality. So, you see, while we cannot imagine the world of four dimensions, we can certainly think about it. Next, INTJs would almost universally self-identify as and be recognized as being creative. They can be artistically creative, but they can also be creative in whatever their particular field is. They can be creative in the realms of finance or in technology or in solving social problems, for example. Next, INTJs tend to be very philosophical. They tend to think a lot about the world that they live in, and they tend to enjoy a good, honest, philosophical debate. 
Next, INTJs tend to be very good with efficiency. They're typically good with logistics and at understanding where leverage is so that they can get the best possible output with the least amount of effort in the input. Tim Ferriss, the author of books like The 4-Hour Workweek and The 4-Hour Body, is a great example of an INTJ who applies this type of thinking. So you wouldn't do your laundry every time you have a new pair of dirty socks. You wait for a certain critical mass of dirty laundry to accumulate, and then you do the laundry. Why? Same with the post office. If you have many different types of mail that are going to come together that you need to mail, you're going to wait for a certain critical mass as opposed to just going there for every single letter because there's a setup cost. There is a task switching cost, getting in the car, driving there, spending the gas, spending the time, laundry, putting it all together, detergent, and so on. Right? So the, the time and labor involved in doing one letter or 20 or one pair of socks or an entire basket of clothing is the same. Next, in a related note, INTJs tend to be very good at effectiveness thinking. They're very good at filtering out things that don't matter in relationship to the result that they want to achieve. INTJs don't like to waste effort, but highly effective INTJs, when they identify something that will require a lot of work but is very important, they'll get their hands dirty and they will spend the time necessary to produce results. Finally, INTJs tend to be future-oriented. They're usually pretty good at figuring out how things are going to play out into the future. This plays into what I said about them as judgers. Just like having the external world structured and taken care of, predicting things into the future also helps them be more in flow. They tend to be more at ease if they understand how things are likely to play out in the future. Now let's talk about some of the nuance of the type, some of the variants, some of the things that can lead INTJs to be mistyped as other types. Number one, they tend to be able to alternate between left and right brained thinking better than most people. So a stereotypical INTJ is probably going to appear more left brain logical, but INTJs have a strong capacity for artistry. INTJ artists and musicians can often be mistyped as ISFPs and INFPs. One sign that an artist might be an INTJ is that they tend to be good at making money and often make sound business decisions. Most ISFPs and INFPs are all about the art. That comes first. And then business decisions and money tend to be less natural for them. INTJs tend to place a high value on money and resources, and they also typically have competence in that realm. So while their artistry may be very important to them, they typically do not lose sight of business concerns. The next topic I want to touch on is malleability. So this is going to be the case for any of the 16 types to some degree, but I think it's often very pronounced with INTJs. Because of their ability to alternate between left and right brain thinking, what they're trained on and the environment that they grow up in and what they spend their time doing is going to influence how they show up in the world. Some INTJs can be very precise and very measured and very cautious and others can appear as very sloppy and very hedonistic. This illustrates how Myers-Briggs is really about cognitive wiring and not about external behavior. Next, there's some variance in terms of how INTJs will show up in the realm of physicality. As I mentioned earlier, INTJs tend to spend a lot of time in their heads. This being the case, in order to balance that out, they need to connect with physical reality. Some will do this in a very pronounced way. They'll gravitate strongly towards things that will create an adrenaline rush, things that will bring them into the moment and into their body. This can be through things like sports or driving fast or sex, drugs, and rock and roll. To illustrate this point, here's Metallica frontman James Hetfield, who you saw earlier in this video. This is a song that he wrote that he's performing with the band. Notice how heavy and driving and kinesthetic this song is. Now, not all INTJs are going to show up like this. There's some variance here. Some INTJs will appear very gentle. So Brian May from the band Queen, for example, or the famous cellist Yo-Yo Ma, or Eckhart Tolle, for example, they all come off as much more gentle. Here's a video of Eckhart Tolle talking about relationship to the physical world. Awareness of 
the simplicity of the present moment, the sense perceptions of the present moment, acknowledge the isness of all things, give, that, give it attention, and refrain as much as possible from labeling your sense perceptions. Next, similarly to how there's a variance in physicality with INTJs, there's also a variance when it comes to emotional maturity and tact. Some INTJs can be very cutthroat and insensitive, and this can lead some people to perceive the INTJ type as being that way. This is simply not true. Many INTJs are very tactful and very considerate and emotionally mature, and INTJs tend to become more this way over time with age. Now let's talk about some INTJ celebrities. INTJ celebrities include author and philosopher Ayn Rand, Rapper and entrepreneur 50 Cent, Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, author Stephen King, physician trauma expert and author Gabor Mate, marketing guru Seth Godin, fashion icon and Vogue editor-in-chief Anna Winter. As a side note, actress Meryl Streep appears to have played Anna Winter as an ESTJ in the film The Devil Wears Prada, but in my assessment, the real Anna Winter is in fact an INTJ. What do you think would be the number one thing that you hope people learn from you and continue to learn from you? To be decisive and to be clear. Next, journalist and world-renowned interviewer Terry Gross, one of the greatest classical composers of all time, Ludwig van Beethoven, and finally, art legend Andy Warhol. Fictional INTJs include Andy Dufresne from Shawshank Redemption, Gus Fring from Breaking Bad, Claire Underwood from House of Cards, The Architect from The Matrix Trilogy, Michael Corleone from The Godfather, Beth Harmon from The Queen's Gambit, and Bruce Wayne from The Dark Knight Trilogy. In summary, INTJs are built to see what others can't see and to make an impact on the world around them. They can use their unique understanding and talents to become cynical manipulators or to become great thinkers, leaders, and artists who light the way for humanity. Overall, they implore us to think for ourselves, to up our games, and to evolve. If you'd like to learn more about the INTJ type, including a much longer list of INTJ celebrities, you can go to whattype.com slash INTJ. And once again, if you are watching this because you're trying to figure out if you are an INTJ and you'd like some help getting clarity on your type, you can go to whattype.com slash mytype to learn about type reading sessions via Zoom. Graham, 